This is Spunky. And Snarky. And we say, welcome welcome to to the the show. Hello and welcome back to another episode. This week we're taking a look at something near and dear to our heart. It's MathNet from the PBS show Square One. And we used to watch this all the time when we were kids. Well, we used to watch Dragnet too, the old 60s cop show with Jack Webb. I mean, classic. And and this was like a PBS parody of it for kids that would teach you math while solving a mystery. Yeah, and we'll get to Dragnet someday because I know there's this particular (laughs) episode we want to talk about. Something about being green in a tree. Anyway, (laughs) let's dive into MathNet. Today we're watching MathNet, the case of the Mystery Weekend from Square One Television, Season 5, Episodes 1 through 5. Square One Television aired on PBS from January 26, 1987 to November 6, 1992. The show taught math to kids using various sketches, cartoons, and games. The ending segment of the show was MathNet, which was a parody of Dragnet, and the main characters were mathematicians trying to solve a crime using math. Each MathNet storyline spanned five episodes or one week of the show. So the show starts out in very Dragnet fashion with the story we're about to tell is a fib, but short. Making fun of the Dragnet opening, this is the city, and parroting it. It's like, the names are made up, but the problems are real. So it's Friday, 9.43 a.m., and Pat Tuesday heads to the office, and she finds her partner, George Frankly, at his desk, and he's, like, dressed up as Sherlock Holmes. (laughs) She's not amused. She's very much the straight man of the duo. She's the smart one, and George is like, you know. He's kind of dumb, but then he's smart because he can do math. He's very, like, willy-nilly or, yeah. you know, just out there. So she's like, what's with the outfit? And he's like, well, you got any plans for the weekend? And she's like, I got some. And he's like, cancel them. Basically, you find out that his wife can't go to the murder mystery weekend he had been planning and is, like, in charge of. So he asks Pat if she'll take his wife's place. Place. It's at a manor house. There's going to be food and six other guests. So it should be lots of fun. Pat is like, okay. He gives her the costume that she needs to wear. And she's just like, uh, great. So later that day, they're driving along, heading to their destination, the Qualms, in a beat up car that they rented. As they're driving, it starts to thunderstorm and they cross this rickety old bridge and they see the sign that says the Qualms and it's pointing to the left. And so they go that way and then you see the wind blowing and it changes the hand of the direction (laughs) sign. They arrive at the manor and when they knock on the door, they're greeted by a butler whose name is Peeved. (laughs) The butler looks a little surprised, but he escorts George and Pat into the drawing room and they meet the other guests who are there. George, who's the captain of the Mystery Weekend, introduces Pat and himself as Sherlock Kondo and Dr. Watson. Sherlock Kondo is the modern version of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> One of the guests asks George if he knows what's going on. What's going and on? George says he doesn't know. The guest introduces himself as Colonel Ashby Wiggins and says that he served in the U.S. Army. Pat notices his British accent and asks him about it. Wiggins says he was captured. The next person they meet is Miles Reed, and he blows, as in the saxophone. He's a jazz musician who talks very beatnik-y. George asks Pat to hand him the Mystery Weekend envelope and reads it aloud, telling them that one of them is responsible for the disappearance of their host, Mr. Barton Big. So everyone has a motive, but only one is the guilty party. And their job is to find out who done it. A lady asks, what the hell are you talking about? And she introduces herself as Amanda Plunk, who is a professional game show contestant. Another lady approaches Pat and George and nervously says that she doesn't know any Mr. Big. She introduces herself as Kitty Feline, a dentist. 
peeved reappears and escorts everyone upstairs and shows them a color-coded floor map that tells them where they'll be staying and tells them to meet downstairs in 15 minutes. So we transition to the dining room where all the guests are gathered for dinner and Pat notices that Kitty isn't there. Right after that, they hear a scream from upstairs and so everyone goes to see what's going on. George checks on the floor map and tells everyone that Kitty is in the red room. So they all run into her room and George starts his investigation, commenting that her room has a larger closet than his. He finds a newspaper clipping that reads, Kitty Cat Found Innocent. Another guest says that she thought her name was Kitty Feline. George, reading the newspaper clipping, says that at 8 a.m. today, Kitty Cat walked through the halls of justice a free woman, exonerated of her accused crime of libel. Pat notices that someone wrote a note across the clipping saying, Justice will be done. Miles then spots a Lady Justice statue on the floor. George looks at it, then suggests that they all return to dinner. Everyone leaves and George says to Pat that no one was supposed to disappear in this game. It must be a new wrinkle. And Pat looks uneasy. Back at the dining room, Colonel Wiggins suggests that they call the police. Amanda agrees, along with another guest named Wally Wallaby, who is an ex-children's television presenter. George asks Wally why he would want to harm Mr. Big. And Wally says that he would never harm anyone. He just wants people to be his friend. Pat asks Miles the same question. And he says in his jazzy way that he's a musician. Never heard of Mr. Big. We meet the last guest, Sally Storm, who's an actress. George says that actresses always have something to hide. And asks her if Barton Big was trying to blackmail her. Sally says that she doesn't know who he is talking about and wants to retire for the night. George suggests everyone do the same and they will start fresh tomorrow. They all go upstairs to the rooms and the clock strikes 10. George is flossing when he hears Miles playing Somewhere Over the Rainbow on his sax while there's a montage of all the other characters getting ready for bed. Later, there is a scream and everyone peeks out of the room and goes back in. Then, there's a second scream and everyone rushes out into the hallway. Pat tells George that she doesn't think that this game is on the up and up. George says who's missing and they realize that Colonel Wiggins has been kidnapped in the orange room. They all go to his room and find another clipping reading, Wigston is free. At exactly 10.03, Lieutenant Colonel Ashby Wigston left federal court a free man after being found innocent of the charge of stealing rare coins. Along with learning about his fake name, the clipping also has the justice will be done message on it. And Miles finds another Lady Justice statue and George comments about the closet size again. Pat asks the others where they were when they heard the scream. They say that they all saw each other except for George who didn't see anyone nor did anyone see him. The other guest starts to question George but Pat tells him that George is the captain of the Mystery Weekend and couldn't have done it. The four remaining guests know nothing about a Mystery Weekend and return to bed. Pat tells George that it's time to call the cops to help them find the two missing guests. Pat and George then go downstairs to use the phone, but quickly realize that the line is dead. So when we cut to the next part, George is coming in from the outside and startles Pat. He tells her that he tried to start his car, but the battery is dead and the bridge is out. So Pat's like, great, we're isolated. George adds that they can't get help till the rain lets up, so they're stuck. Peeved arrived, startling them, and George asked him about the mystery weekend at the Quams. Peeved tells him that he must have made a wrong turn because this is wit's end. He's been a servant there for 15 years, and he doesn't know who the owner is. The owner communicates by sending written notes. Pat asks him what were the instructions for the weekend, and he says he was supposed to prepare the house for six guests and that the owner was to arrive tomorrow at noon, but it's unlikely now because of the storm. George asks him if there's a basement or any secret rooms and Peeve says no. George asks about the Lady Justice statue because they noticed some in the room and Peeve said that there have been six statues on the bookcase ever since he has worked there. And then Peeve leaves and George and Pat realize that there's three statues missing and they've only found two for the two missing people. So somebody else is going to be be missing soon. So they go over to the color floor map and they deduce that if everyone is telling the truth, then nobody could have been in the hall without being seen. But Sally and Wally saw each other and no one else 
saw them, so maybe they're in cahoots with each other. They hear another scream and rush upstairs, and they find Sally, Miles, and Amanda outside their room. Pat and George enter Wally's room to find he's gone. So that's their theory busted. He's gone. Yeah. Oh, he's He's gone. gone. (laughs) So they find the news clipping. Wally Waffle walks. Another name change. He was found innocent of robbery at 11.05 a.m. Pat notices the justice will be done scrawled across the newspaper article and finds the missing lady justice statue while George notices that he has a bigger closet than him again. So we cut to all the guests sitting in the drawing room. George walks in and says that he searched the whole house and found no sign of any of the missing guests and suggests that they all stay together so no one will go missing and everyone agrees. Pat goes over the missing guests' invitations and sees that they were all addressed to their real names that showed up in the newspaper articles. She then asks Amanda Miles and Sally if their invitations had their real names on them and they reluctantly said yes. So Pat decides to play the game. What do we know? She knows that the three people who were kidnapped all changed their names and all three were accused of crimes and found innocent. So they ask, have the other three also been accused of crimes and then found innocent? And they don't want to give it up, but admit that it's true. Sally says that she came to the manor because the invitation was sent to her with her old name and she hadn't used that in years. So she wanted to find out what the person wanted. And they all say the same thing. The invitation was addressed to them in their real name. And so they wanted to get to the bottom of who was behind this. So Pat and George try to find if there's any more similarities between all the people, like if they had the same judge or prosecutor, but they didn't find any. So Sally decides she's feeling a little perched and decides that she needs some tea. So she goes to find pee. Meanwhile, Pat notices that all the invitations were mailed from Sullivan County, which is the county they're in, and suggests that maybe Peeved wrote and mailed them. George says that maybe Peeved knows more than he's telling, but then suddenly there's another scream and Sally rushes out of the kitchen and tells him that something happened to Peeved. Everyone runs to the kitchen to find Peeve lying on the ground and there's a huge lump on his forehead and he is not out cold. So later we cut to Pat playing with a 3D tic-tac-toe game when George returns and tells her that he gave Peeved an ice pack and put him to bed. Miles wants to know who knocked out Peeved. And Pat says it couldn't have been one of them since they were all together. And Amanda says, well, not really because Sally was in the kitchen with Peeved. And then Sally is just outraged at the notion and says she just opened the door and he was lying on the floor. They bicker and then Sally decides to return to her room even though Pat says they should still stay together. Miles and Amanda decide to leave as well. Pat and George return to the billiards room and Pat says that there must be someone else in the house and they go over the times the guests disappear. And then George teaches Pat how to play color pool, which uses seven balls, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, plus black and white to shoot. Pat notices that the colored floor mat coincides with the colors of the balls on the table. George shoots and the white ball hits the red, orange, and yellow ball. Each of the guests that are missing were in one of those colored rooms, going in the order of the color wheel. They realize that the next person to be taken is in the green room, which is Amanda. George realizes that the articles mention the time each accused person was released and it could be another pattern. Pat then notices another Lady Justice statue missing from the bookcase as a scream rings out. Pat and George rush to the green room, but find Miles in there. He says that he switched rooms with Amanda because he had a hunch. And then they all rush over to the blue room and find the same things. You know, Lady Justice statue, big closet, and a newspaper clipping saying Amanda Wine was set free at 12.07 p.m. Innocent of a fur robbery. Miles says that he figured out the color wheel pattern and knew green was next. So he switched rooms with Amanda in hopes of catching the culprit, but it didn't work. Sally arrives and says that she can't take any more of this. George asks Sally and Miles what time they were released. 
Miles says sometime around 1 p.m. And Sally says at 12.45 p.m. They all head back downstairs and Pat and George discuss the patterns. If the color pattern is correct, then Miles will be the next to go missing. But if the time pattern is correct, then Sally is next. George decides to tail Miles, who is going to bed, and Pat pretends to go to bed but hides behind some plants to watch Sally. After a while, a scream rings out. Pat runs upstairs while George runs downstairs and they crash into each other at the landing. They both say they heard a scream, one from upstairs and one from downstairs. Pat and George go to check on Sally and Miles and find a Lady Justice statue and a newspaper clipping saying that Sally Stoop and Miles to go were both found not guilty at 1245 and then there were none. So part five opens and we see George measuring one foot to the other. And he's like, my room is bigger, but his closet is half the size of the other rooms. He's like, why does it show on the floor diagram that they're actually the same size, but in reality, they're not. So he goes in the closet and finds a lever opening a secret door that connects his room, the black room, to the orange room. And then they continue to look and And it turns out that the orange room is also connected to the red room on the left side of the hall. Pat and George check the rest of the closets in the house and find out that the yellow and the violet rooms in the upper right corner are connected while the white, blue, and yellow rooms connect on the lower right side of the hall. They're connected yet disconnected because the three different groups don't have a connection. So the culprit would have had to use the hallway George notices that two of the Lady Justice statues are back on the bookshelf, meaning that the culprit is still in the house. Pat notices the 3D tic-tac-toe game that's on the mantle, and then she thinks to herself, maybe the rooms are connected. They're just connected from the first floor and then go up to the second floor through a secret stairwell. So they look at the floor map, and George thinks that his closet, since it's so small, must have some sort of stairwell in it. And all the guests were abducted in the same way with a scream, clipping, and statue except for Peeve. The phone rings and Pat goes to answer it while George checks on Peeve. Pat tells the operator to send help and then goes to find George in Peeve's room, but he's not there. Pat decides to play What Do I Know as she tries not to freak out that she's alone and goes over the facts. When she hears someone behind her, she turns around and it's peeved. She says the butler really did do it as a slow chase begins with Pat trying to escape. Peeve tells her that he planned the whole thing and he hates math. That's just like a shock to her system. (laughs) He says that all the guests were guilty but because of math they were set free. He also tells Pat that he is the owner of the house and that he used to be a court stenographer. That's how he knew about all the guests' cases and knew that they were really guilty. Pat reminds him that they were all found innocent by a jury of their peers as she runs searching for an escape but then someone grabs her from behind and pulls her into a secret passageway it's george who tells her that these passages run throughout the house and he has been listening to their conversation because the house is wired for sound saying that they only heard a recording of a female and male scream that were set at specific times They try all the buttons on the sound system and hear that the other guests are in the dungeon. They continue down the passageway to the dungeon where Peeve has everyone in a cage and is dressed as a judge with a powdered wig and all. He starts to pass judgment on them and Pat sneaks over and grabs the gavel from a podium and sticks it into Peeve's back mimicking a gun. We cut to the sitting room with the freed guests and George is tying Peeve to a chair. Pat gets off the phone and says that the police will be here shortly. And we hear sirens in the distance. And Pat says, all is well, giving George a math net high five. Peeves was tried and convicted of kidnapping in the first degree, official misconduct, and for menacing. He went to prison and learned to love mathematics, teaches it to others, and has become an advisor for a television show called Square One TV. And that's the end of the episode. So thoughts on the episode? It was pretty funny. They use a lot of puns. In all the episodes, they use like pun names and stuff. Well, that's the same with Pat Tuesday instead of Joe Friday. 
And Kate Monday was the original lady in the earlier seasons of Math Ed, but then she left. I appreciate how they try to sneak in the math stuff. Like, it's not super obvious, but it's there. But yeah, it was a fun watch. Yeah, um, this is one I really remembered a lot as a kid because it does remind me of Clue. That movie's awesome. With the colored rooms and everything and like Colonel Wiggins <laughs> and the different characters and stuff. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. We'll talk more about Math Net and stuff in the Burning Basement. All right, welcome to the Brain Basement, where today we're going to talk more about Square One, MathNet, and other things. So this was a show we used to watch a lot as kids in the summertime, like this in 3 one Contact, which we talked about in our Bloodhound Gang episode, episode 18, if you want to go back and listen to that one. We watched a lot of PBS as a kid, Reading Rainbow and all that good stuff. The thing I liked about Square One is it was educational, but it was like sneaky educational. Like it wasn't like... In your face educational. Yeah. It was still like a fun, cool show because it would do like music videos, and games and stuff. And me being a mystery lover, love Dragnet. I watched a lot on Nick at Night. So then I was like, oh, MathNet. I'll watch that too. Even though, like Peeves. She don't like math. <laughs> okay. It's not that I don't like math. I was always bad at math. So I'm like slightly dyslexic when it comes to numbers and letters, but usually I can catch it. I just can't do math in my head. I can, but it's going to take me like 20 minutes to figure out a simple problem. So I was never good at math where the snarky was because my dad was good at math. She got the good math genes, I guess. (laughs) I always was good at math where I couldn't read. And I like to read. Yeah, I love PBS too because PBS is where I got introduced to anime because I used to play it at night and uncensored. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah, that's the one we used to watch. Tenchi Tenchi Muyo. Muyo. Yes, that was a great show. I like PBS because they have, like, cool documentaries yes. and concerts and stuff. So, like, much love to PBS. I watched that ABBA one a couple months ago. That was really good. I love a good music documentary. Well, I'll watch a documentary on anything as long as it's interesting. Like, I don't care. <laughs> I watched a documentary last week about, like, the black pharaohs of Egypt. It was interesting. I like weird history stuff. Would you ever do a murder mystery weekend? You know, I've always loved the thought of it, but I'm really shy, so I don't know. I remember there was, like, Golden Girls episode where they did the mystery weekend, and they thought Blanche legit killed someone. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good By episode. having sex with them? <laughs> well, she was going to, but then he turned up dead. <laughs> <In> premature evacuation. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let's move on. To the music spotlight! Alright, welcome to the music spotlight, where today's topic is number songs. First up on the list is Three Dog Night with One. Is the loneliest number that you ever knew. Yeah, we talked about Three Dog Night in our Father's Day episode we did where my dad would play this album. It had 20 songs and like maybe like six of them were good and then the rest were like really <laughs> annoying. <laughs> yeah. So number two, <laughs> we got a Rob Bass and DJ EZ Rock. With it our- takes two to make things all right. It takes two to make it ass. Huh? Yeah, this is a jam. Moving on to number three. One of our mom's favorite groups. Mm-hmm. She used to play their records all the time. It's Tony Orlando and Dawn with Knock three times on the ceiling if you want me. Twice on the pipe. Boom, boom. boom. If the answer is no. That was a good song. He did have a very smooth voice, I will say. And Thelma Hopkins from Dawn later went on to be Aunt Rachel on Family Matters. And she was in a bunch of TV shows as well. Anyway, moving on to number four, we have Electric Light Orchestra with Four Little Diamonds. Four Little Diamonds. This is another song I found through my favorite video game of all time, Grand Theft Auto Vice City, which has an excellent 80s soundtrack. And ELO's awesome. I mean, they have a ton of great hits, like Evil Woman, which is Snarky's theme song. Pretty much. (laughs) They're great. Moving on to number five. It's one of Snarky's favorites. It's The Vogues with Five O'Clock World. It's a five o'clock world when the whistle blows. No one knows a piece of my time. This used to be one of the theme songs for the Drew Carey show. Yeah, it's just a great song. Yeah, it's a really good 60s jam. It's a working man's jam. Yeah. 
And if you didn't notice the pattern we had by now, each of the songs, one through five, had the numbers one through five in them. So we have two honorable mentions this week. We each picked one. And mine I picked because it's an 80s song that no one probably knows. It's kind of obscure, but I still like it. It's a group called New Music, and their song is called Living by Numbers. It's very early synth pop, and I love it. My honorable mention should be a song that everybody knows. It is the Pointer Sisters with the pinball number count from Sesame Street. Another PBS show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. twelve. And apparently, my friend told me one time, we were having a conversation about this, that there's like the extended mix, which is like, thirteen. (laughs) <laughs> Someone else like added 14. more to it. It's like so funky for number counting that you gotta love it. And the animation's awesome too. So those are our number songs. And if you want to hear these songs in full, you can check them out on our website. Thanks for listening to another episode of our show. Next week we'll be having a spring Easter holiday event. So come back and see us. If you want to drop us a line, you can email us at spunkyandsnarkyshow at gmail.com. You can check out our website, which is spunkyandsnarkyshow.wordpress.com. You can leave us a voice message on our Anchor page, which is anchor.fm slash spunkyandsnarkyshow. You can like or contact us on our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok pages. If you can't find the links to those, are on our website. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Peace. Bye.